Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, I'm John, this is many a true nerd, and welcome back to Fallout Tale of Two Wastelands. Well, last time, I played with some weapons of mass destruction in order to get hold of the best piece of armour in the game. A piece of armour I'm not wearing because I literally can't, I don't know how power armour works, and uh, I'm not going to learn how power armour works until I make some plot progress. So, uh, how about we do precisely that? And what's rather lovely about Fallout 3 is that could mean a whole bunch of different things. Like officially we were told by 3Dog to go to Rivet City and speak to Dr. Lee, she'll give me my next lead. But we don't need to do that. In Fallout 3 the first act is wide open, you can do it in any order of your choosing. In fact, as many of you may know, there's literally nothing to stop you stepping out of Vault 101, turning to face west and walking in a straight line. You'll get to your dad in 10 minutes or so. But instead today, I want to take you back in time to my very first ever playthrough of Fallout 3 because, fun fact, I accidentally sequence broke the main plot. The year is probably about 2009 and my first playthrough is precisely as you see it now. I have been to 3Dog, he's told me to go to Rivet City to get more information. I didn't know about Anacostia Crossing and the good shortcut that gets you there, so naturally I was following the route most people do, following the river straight down. At which point at the exact moment you turn left to continue around the corner to Rivet City, I notice a really bloody big building ahead of me. And just not being desperately well informed at the time about various major US monuments in Washington DC, I had no idea what that building was ahead of me, so I decided to go and check it out. I do find this a really bloody odd choice by the way, that um, yes, you literally walk past where the main quest is going to send you just before the main quest sends you there. Meaning I refuse to admit I'm the only person who explored this giant interesting looking ruin and you know, sort of by accident skipped ahead a couple of steps in the plot. Although one thing that did occur to me while I was thinking about this was, uh, yes, possibly this occurred due to Rivet City moving. You may recall in a previous episode when we were looking at Rivet City, I was discussing how, yes, in the base game, the orientation of Rivet City versus the doors doesn't actually make sense, because the boat was moved to relatively last minute in Fallout 3's developments. It was originally supposed to be round the corner in the river somewhere round here. So it's entirely possible, yes, the original intended route was that people would walk down at this bank of the river, the same bank that, yes, the Super Duper Mart is on, get to the boat, speak to Dr. Lee, then cross over to the Jefferson Memorial. You don't walk straight bloody past it on your way to Rivet City. So yes, I suspect a last minute move of Rivet City is what caused so much confusion to poor young 2009 era John. And as a bonus extra, I genuinely can't remember what happens if you never speak to Dr. Lee before your dad gets rescued. So you know what, let's set that up today. So step one, a handful of super mutants go down. And when I say go down, I do mean rather literally because yes, they're taking a lovely knockout damage, just knocking them to the floor. Be flipping beautiful. Down you go, down you go, two in a minute, buddy. Ah, oh, the victory rifle. It's just so wonderful. There are a few interesting things going on in this area, by the way, but um, yes, let's leave those two we're here properly as part of the waters of life. Instead, uh, yes, just... Imagine the confusion of poor young baby John, who is just following signs to a bloody gift shop. And then literally just around the corner, I stumble across a pile of audio logs from the exact guy I'm bloody looking for. Even in Vault 101, my work on Project Purity never really stopped. Soon after we arrived, my nightly routine included sneaking into the restricted areas, searching for, I don't know, whatever I could find. It was a Voltaic facility, after all. The place was built with some of the most advanced technology this country had ever developed. Those excursions never turned up anything particularly useful. So, one night after half a bottle of scotch, I broke into the overseer's office. It was easy enough to hack his console, gain access to the restricted files. Most of it was garbage. Propaganda, spy reports, just plain rambling bullshit, really. But there was one thing, one name that stood out amongst all the others. Dr. Stanislaus Braun. I knew of Braun's work, of course. He was a celebrity in his day, 
Voltec's sorcerer scientist, leaving his peers in awe of his technological wizardry. But it was in Vault 101 that night in the overseer's office. I first learned of Braun's involvement in Voltec's social preservation program and his work on something called GEC, the Garden of Eden creation kit. Oh, bloody hell, the GEC. Right, yes, this is a fascinating piece of technology. To be honest, the GEC sounded like pure fantasy, even for someone of Braun's capabilities. It was nothing short of a miracle. A terraforming module capable of producing life from complete lifelessness. But not only was this thing a reality, it was actually distributed to several vaults to be used after an atomic war. Vault 101 was, sadly, not on that list. I did some digging and discovered Braun's name on the reservation list for a Vault 112. And no slouch, but this man, he could have easily succeeded where I failed. Does his collected knowledge remain within the halls of Vault 112? Journals? Holotapes, computer records, maybe even experiments. If I could gain access to just a fraction of Braun's genius, Project Purity would become a reality. So, okay, we've got ourselves a destination, Vault 112, though. Don't worry about that for now, seriously. We need to talk about the gate, which is possibly the single most baffling and inconsistent piece of technology in the entire Fallout franchise, because uh, it is completely unclear, despite the fact it's shown up across multiple games, uh, both older and new Fallout, what precisely the GEC is, or indeed, uh, what precisely it does. It's definitely a briefcase-shaped thing, and inside it, there's a bunch of, like, technological things, but as for what it actually does, well, the games are wildly inconsistent about, yes, precisely how technological and sexy it actually is. Like, the core seems to be, somehow, it makes soil more fertile. That every single game agrees on. Vault 15 had a gek. They used it to set up Shady Sands, and uh, when you rock into Shady Sands in Fallout 1, that's a society that had access to a functional gek, and uh, they're doing okay, but honestly, like, have they been blessed by a technological marvel of uh, impossible scientific power? Honestly, no, they're a small hamlet that's managed to make some crops grow. That seems to be the limit of the Gex power. And as for how it does this, nobody ever says. In old Fallout and new Fallout, it's just a magic MacGuffin briefcase that nobody ever explains. It just does uh, precisely what the plot needs it to. And uh, you know what? Credit to Fallout 76 for actually coming up with one of the most interesting gek related ideas uh, in the entire franchise, which is uh, how a gek improperly used uh, could go extremely badly wrong. Specifically, it caused out of control growth and mutation, uh, leading to a massively overgrown area called the Maya in Fallout 76's Wasteland, which was really rather bloody cool. But yes, despite having a location, that's not actually good enough to update the quest. You've got to listen to the final entry, number 10. I'm off to Vault 112 to search for anything of bronze that might help me get this purifier up and running. All I know is that it's west of some place called Evergreen Mills. And it's well hidden in some sort of garage. But I'll find it. I have to. It's so close. But that's the story of Project Purity, isn't it? An eternity of almost theirs. Let's see if Braun has the missing puzzle piece. And as soon as we've listened to that, officially, we've already spoken to Dr. Lee about Dad and Project Purity, meaning we can now move straight on to Vault 112. Fun fact though, if you do this in the wrong order, and thus already know where your dad's going before you speak to Dr. Lee, but go and speak to her before going to Vault 112 anyway, she does have a handful of extra lines. Here we go, three new options, though yes, only one of them is in any way particularly interesting. The bottom one, she doesn't know where Vault 112 is, she can't tell you. As for the gag, she just says, don't bother, it's not worth it. The middle one, however, ask her about Braun, she'll go into a bit more detail about him. I can't tell you anything more than I told James. I know who Braun was, yes, but he lived before the war. The odds of any of his research surviving after all this time... <laughs> Well, it, it just doesn't make sense to go looking for it. James kept talking about this vault, 112, he said, and insisting we should go there. It's just madness. 
And then we just loop back into the normal conversation that you would have with her if you'd just come here when you were supposed to in the first place. And, uh, okay, technically, that doesn't provide you with uh, any information you didn't already have. But it is a good reminder that, yes, Braun is a pre-war scientist. And uh, pre-war is 200 years ago at this point. So, you know, just something to keep in mind uh, as we make our way towards the Vault 112. Still, let's just pretend that conversation didn't happen because, yes, once again, I am curious how she reacts if she's never met you before when your dad rocks back up again because that would mean she had no idea anyone was ever looking for him in the first place. He'd just sort of show up out of nowhere. As for the vault, simplicity itself, Evergreen Mills was mentioned, but yes, for me, Jocko's pop a gas door and Gerda Shade are also about the same distance away, barely even round the corner, a nice easy jaunt for me. Though yes, eyes open as we actually get close by, I assume by design just to, you know, try and dissuade low-level characters from just accidentally stumbling across the vault, there are some nasty bits and pieces floating around nearby. So to the south or right here, we've got a bear immediately knocked over, be flipping beautiful, there we go, nice sneak attack crit, and uh, yes, if I'm recalling correctly, on the road to the north of the garage... There we go, a military checkpoint staffed with appropriately leveled robots on this occasion. Yeah, sentry bots. So, uh, nasty. Nasty piece of work here. They did kind of surround this building with uh, a few mean bits and pieces. Uh, just to kind of, you know, try and dissuade the low-level players uh, from stumbling across the secrets. Still, we are not one of those people. We are nice and high level. We were told to come here. Everything is fine. So, just crack the switch and open up the path down to the vault, though. I do enjoy how, yes, there are some uh, very subtle indications that this garage is not all that it seems, uh, even if you didn't know the vault was here. Like, say, uh, right here, in this completely normal garage, uh, there are two gun cabinets next to each other, which definitely feels, you know, not entirely right for a completely normal, unsuspicious garage. Then just take out the local critters that are floating about, because, yes, a handful of mole rats have gotten at some point. I like to believe uh, that this occurred during the last infiltration uh, of Vault 112, because uh, bear in mind, even within Fallout 3, you and your dad are not the first people uh, to break into this vault. In fact, we met the person who did it before previously. He mentioned it on his terminal, Pinkerton uh, from Rivet City, as we mentioned when we were doing the Replicated Man. Uh, that's where he got Harkness's personality matrix from. Uh, he broke into Vault 112 uh, to get it out of, yes, the mysterious experiment that Braum was running here, which is rather delightful. And honestly, Vault 112 deserves to be broken into, given, uh, yes, apparently uh, they just sort of uh, forgot to lock the door. And we're definitely not supposed to be assuming that, yes, I plugged my pit boy in, there just wasn't an animation for it, because, uh, as we've established, Pinkerton already broke in and then left again. Though, okay, maybe we could politely assume this vault was locked, but Pinkerton, being a genius, cracked open the door and didn't bother to lock it behind him. Welcome to Vault 112, resident. According to sensors, you have arrived 202.3 years behind schedule. Please redress in your Vault Tech issued Vault Suit before proceeding. Once dressed, please proceed down the stairs to the main floor so that you may enter your assigned Tranquility Lounger. That is an odd line from the Robo Brain, by the way, because yes, they do specify you are 202 years late. Despite the fact that yes, the war was 2077 and Fallout 3 begins in 2277. So either somebody made a mistake in terms of yes, the chronology of Fallout, or alternatively, this vault was sealed in 2075, two years before the Great War, though that certainly doesn't seem particularly likely. The game isn't kidding, by the way. You literally have to put on your Vault 112 jumpsuit, or the game will simply not allow you to go inside the lounge arm. There we go, literally you're blocked from doing so, but uh, we're not in a rush to hop in the lounger. How about we have a bit of a loopsy roundy first? After all, the advantage of coming here nice and late is, uh, yes indeed, we can crack open all the computers and doors uh, before we even step inside Tranquility Lane. Here we go, nice little pile of medicine and whatnot. Help myself to all of that. A lovely ammunition, very useful for that gun. And most crucially, the Overseer's Vault password. Lovely. 
I do really enjoy this, by the way. How, yes, the game does not actually force you to go into Tranquility Lane and get sucker punched by what's going on inside. You can absolutely, if you want to, break into the back areas of the vault and do a bit of exploring before you actually get into the simulation yourself. And there the chap is inside his lounger. The door computer did say welcome Dr. Braun, so reasonable assumption that there is Dr. Braun. Well over 200 years old at this point. And while you can't verify it in his office, everybody else inside their lounger has got themselves, yes, a lovely terminal right here where you can check on their status, various vital statistics, and their current stress level, etc, etc. So using that, we can verify these people are still alive. Reasonable assumption, putting two and two together, so is Braun. And if Braun's pre-war and still alive, these individuals are going to be as well. So yes, you can figure out before you even step inside the simulation, these machines have been keeping the same people alive for well over two centuries. But there's one other interesting bit of information you might want to gather before you step inside the simulation. Which is, yes, the stress level for each individual resident. So, uh, the lovely Timmy will be meeting Timmy momentarily. So, uh, he's got some statistics going on here. Nothing too dramatic. And stress level is nominal. So, Timmy's fine. Timmy's doing A-OK. -okay. But that's not true for everybody. And it's kind of interesting to note and try and remember who's stressed and how stressed they are. So, Mabel Henderson, for example, she's doing A-OK -okay as well. Ditto Mr. Foster, and both of Timmy's parents just the same. But the Rockwells, however, check their stress level, that's become elevators. And Mrs. Simpson just round the corner, same deal, stress level has been elevated, so just uh, yeah, keep those individuals in mind. If you're very good at Liam Neeson spotting, then yep, we've got our father right here in this lounger. Again, would you believe it, he's a bit stressed out under the circumstances. And finally, Mrs. Dithers, at the highest stress level of all, extreme. Resident requires medical attention and, uh, oh, Mrs. Dithers. This one is, yes, quite frankly, a really bloody sad story. Still, that's all we can learn here. Let's just slip on the jumpsuit, crack open the lounger and... Uh, okay, admittedly, now I'm curious. Having opened the lounger... Can I just take off the jumpsuit and just, you know, go in outside of the jumpsuit or is the game going to be very fussy and... Please put on your standard issue vault tech suit before using the Tranquility Lounger. Nope, the game saw me coming. Right, in which case, into the right outfit. Though, admittedly, I do have a giant sniper rifle attached to my back. In, we flippy go to... Honestly, one of my favourite set pieces... In all of Fallout history, this is just one a hell of a showstopper to wrap up the end of, uh, yeah, the first act of Fallout 3. It is uh, something truly bloody weird and special, and it's not just me that thinks so. Various Bethesda devs have said over the years, uh, Tranquility Lane is one of their favourite missions in Fallout 3 as well. Hey there, sport. Beautiful day, isn't it? Say, you should go talk to Betty. She's waiting for you over on the playground. Have fun, sport. But yes, just in case this is your first trip through Fallout 3 and this is all brand new to you, just have a chat with anybody dodged around Tranquility Lane and uh, yes, things are definitely a bit uh, off here, shall we say. Good day to you. Good day to you too, sir. And uh, any chance you've seen my dance? Nope, afraid not. Don't you worry about it, though. You'll find him. Which is very reassuring if, um, yes, not necessarily that helpful. And uh, nice day, isn't it, sir? Another perfect Saturday afternoon. Make sure you enjoy it, sport. So, yes, George here is having a lovely, lovely day. Everyone's very friendly. Even old lady Dithers, though she's lost most of her marbles. Yes, indeed. George Nesbaum, of course, we saw him earlier. His stress level was normal. He's integrated perfectly nicely into the simulation. But uh, yes, just a small reminder there. Possibly some people haven't done to quite such an extent. Meanwhile, if you try and tell him about the whole Tranquility Lounger business... Sounds like you've been spending too much time with your nose and those darned comic books, sport. And yes, indeed. No chance you could persuade him about that. 
I do enjoy, by the way, how, yes, even right here at the very first moment of the simulation where everybody's just playing a happy families in this perfect neighborhood, uh, you can sort of tell something's not quite right under the surface. So, uh, yes, Martha Simpson, right here, who you may recall, had a somewhat elevated stress level. Here we go. Ask her about the neighborhoods. I like it well enough, I suppose. Mabel is good company most of the time, and, well... The other neighbors are mostly very nice. Oh yeah, you can tell something's wrong beneath the surface right there, and uh, we'll be getting back later into precisely what that is. I've never actually seen anyone acknowledge this before, but yes, you can actually correlate the level of stress listed on the computer outside with how happy each of these individuals seems to be the first time you chat with them. So just like Hello. Mr. Simpson, you may recall that yes, both the Rockwells were rather stressed out. So once again, ask him about the neighborhoods. Heck of a place to live. Janet and I, well, we're quite happy here. Oh yeah, you know something's not right there. Roger suggested we move here. I don't quite remember when that was. It's very nice. We're doing quite well. So yes, indeed, you might start to see a bit of a pattern there, which is uh, people start getting stressed out as they lose their grip as to whether or not this place is real. Uh, speaking of which... Here we go, poor old Lady Dithers, and seriously, this woman has got one of the most heartbreaking tragedies in all of Fallout 3 if you actually think about it. You? You don't belong here. You're not supposed to be here. It's not real, none of it. It needs to end. The suffering must end. So poor old old Lady Dithers is, yes, fully aware that this isn't real, and she's been aware of that fact for over 200 years, and... Uh, if Braun got his way, she'd keep suffering through this forever, trapped in an environment that she can't escape from, and she can't tell anybody else about it because they refuse to believe it. Basically, she's just being tortured and will go on to be tortured forever. We're not really here. We're not really talking. It's all made up. Make believe. We're sleeping, dreaming. The dream became a nightmare. It has to end. It just has to. But we're not in charge. He is. And he doesn't want us to wake up. And there we go. We start to get some real answers. He calls himself Betty now, but he's still the same. He can put on a new face all he likes, but underneath he's still evil. Braun. Bastard thinks because he helped create this place, he's God here. But I know he still uses the fail-safe terminal. I know it. And there we go, one of the two solutions, but... Dithers, why is it only you that knows this? Don't know. Can't sleep sometimes. Hear voices. My own skin doesn't feel right. None of this is right. You've got to believe me. You've got to find that failsafe. No, seriously. The story of our old lady Dithers is absolutely bloody horrifying that she spent every moment of her life for 200 years very keenly aware that she herself isn't real, that her own skin doesn't feel right to her. It is, uh, it's truly horrifying. It's in the abandoned house. He doesn't want us going in there because he's afraid we might find it. It's the only terminal to the outside. The only way to shut the whole thing down. You've got to find it. And that's pretty much all we're getting out of Old Lady Dithers. So step over to the abandoned house. It's literally next door to Old Lady Dithers. And no reason not to activate the failsafe terminal immediately. Even if we don't necessarily want to. Yes, make a choice straight away. So uh, here we go. The code which I've just entered so many times it's now seared into my memory. So uh, broken radio. So picture to gnome to a picture again send a block and then the final two a gnome around to a bottle there we flip it go one failsafe terminal that once again can fill us in on a bit more information so here we go version control on this here terminal welcome dr braun definitely the right terminal here display previous version notes new program tranquility lane loaded authorization dr braun all previous versions wiped Authorization, 
S. Braun. So Braun's in control of everything, and as for the current version, exceptions granted for pod 0001, reasonable assumption that's going to be Braun up in the office, we saw that previously, manual override for pods disabled, remote access allowed, user S. Braun has privileges. Okay, he's in charge of everything. Updated neural inputs to override memory access for individual users. He can literally control what they do and don't remember. Revised code for vault maintenance robot. Authentication from S. Braun required before further updates allowed. User unknown granted access. User unknown altered by S. Braun. If you're paying attention to the terminals outside the simulation, you know user unknown is your dad. He was the one sitting in the lounger where he was identified as unknown because he wasn't supposed to be there. And we can also, yes, get a look into previous versions of this simulation that Dr. Braun used previously. So, two can Lagoon, but unfortunately, that has run its course. I'm tired of the beating sun and ceaseless pounding of the Lagoon's waves on the shore. I no longer take pleasure in watching Simpson wither away from scurvy or hearing Nesbaum screams as he's devoured by the Mako shark. I am, quite simply, bored. It's time to reset the simulation once again. So, yes, he was definitely just treating these people like toys to play with. And speaking of uh, skiing, as he was saying at the end there, here we go. Yesterday, Dither slipped on the chalet's icy stairs, went airborne, and managed to impale herself on the wrought iron fence. It was spectacular and completely and utterly random. Is there anything more sublime than that bold crimson on fresh fallen snow? It was almost enough to make me reconsider a change of scenery, but not quite. 23 years is a long enough vacation in the Swiss Alps. I long for something more domestic. So yes, trying to figure out the exact timescale of Tranquility Lane is a, a bit difficult to do. We can't be certain, for example, there wasn't a version that predated Toucan Lagoon that just isn't listed here. But we might be able to make an estimate based on, yes, the next notes. I find Tranquility Lane comforting. Though distinctly American, it somehow reminds me of Cronach, the town of my childhood. There's a beautiful irony with this particular simulation as well. The residents here are naturally at home, naturally safe. When I toy with them, when their suburban illusion is suddenly broken, it's that much more satisfying. I do believe we shall all remain here in Tranquility Lane for a very long time. A very long time indeed. So, okay, I guess we could reasonably suggest maybe he was in Toucan Lagoon and the skiing area for a couple of decades each, but we've been in Tranquility Lane for well over a century at this point. Still, finally to, yes, what Old Lady Dithers was telling us about. The Failsafe Program. Dr. Braun, here's the revised code for the military training program you've expressed interest in. Not exactly sure what you want with it, and I again stress that this program was never designed to be run with civilian equipment. Frankly, I don't expect any system you have access to can even run it. But if you can run this program with the failsafe's offer as requested, your real-world test subjects will die if killed in the simulation. It goes without saying officially, I denied your request. General Constantine Chase. So... There we flipping go. The point of the failsafe program is that we know these people die over and over and over again and just get brought back, their memories reset, etc, etc. But uh, yes, if we were to turn this on, them dying would lead to them dying. And Dr. Braun's got opinions on that. There are days I consider pulling the plug as it were and putting a permanent end to both the simulation and my life. That's the reason I requested installation of General Chase's Chinese invasion program after all. By disabling the safety protocols, I've ensured that every subject in Vault 112 will die if their in-simulation avatars are killed. Real-world death, end of simulation, the perfect failsafe. Or at least it would have been, if not for my own misjudgment. I knew when the simulation first went online that the secondary safeties, those established for all Vault Tech and military personnel, would prevent my own real-world demise in the event of a failsafe execution. In the end, I would kill the subjects and save myself. I wouldn't want it any other way, or so I thought. I have no ability to disable my own safety from within the simulation, and any other avatars I could create would be driven by the simulation's AI routines, not actual living, thinking human subjects. Where's the fun in tormenting a machine? And so the release of the real world subjects is more than they deserve, and more than I could bear. They'd be dead, and I'd be left here in Tranquility Lane, alone and tragically bored for all eternity. I can think of nothing more unacceptable. So there we go. All we need to do is push the button. Everybody gets put out of their misery. So we're not going to be doing that because that's not the fun option, damn it. 
And this is where Tranquility Lane, as amazing as it is, can't help but slightly let me down. For the simple reason that we now know what's going on. Having spoken to Old Lady Dithers, having looked at the terminal, having read all of that, we know that Braun is Betty. We know what's happening in the simulation. We know that people are trapped here, etc, etc, etc. But if you do all that before speaking to Betty, and then instead of just pushing the button, go and speak to Betty anyway, not only can you not actually, you know, challenge her on any of these points, your character is determined to play dumb about everything that you already know, which I can't help but be a little bit disappointed about. Oh, someone new to play with. What good luck I have lately. I was just starting to get bored. Oh, we're going to have so much fun. And yes, unfortunately, despite knowing precisely where I am and who this is and all the rest of it, my character is aggressively determined to ignore the information that she already has access to. I'm Betty. I live here on Tranquility Lane. Want to play a game? It's a really simple game. All you have to do is make Timmy Newsbomb cry. And there we go. I'm sure I can pull that one off. You can? I guess we'll see. Huh. Good luck. I mean, I'm going to be honest, Betty, it's not particularly difficult. You can literally just walk up to him and punch him, and that's it. Good enough. She's not desperately satisfied by the resolution, but it does do the job. But yes, for some reason, Betty seems to believe this would be incredibly complicated. Just give him a few little punches, and there we go. That's literally good enough. But no, 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 no. That's nowhere near the level of evil we want to hand out to this chap here. And that is one of the nice things about this area, of course. Everything you're asked to do, there are like three or four different alternative solutions. On this occasion, though, I would probably recommend not doing the speech checks. I feel like, yes, basically, they're just a way of skipping the far more interesting creative ways of uh, causing pain and suffering. What's far more amusing is, yes, just going into their kitchen, finding a military school brochure, the Hoffman Training Academy, turning the delinquents of today into the leads of tomorrow, and lying to him about how he's about to get shipped off to military academy. What? No, I'm not. Oh, yes, you are. Here's the brochure, kiddo. But, but I don't want to go away. I don't want to leave my mommy. Okay, so that's another way of doing it, but he's just given away something critical, which is uh, he's particularly attached to his mother, and uh, yes indeed. After so many years, uh, I think there's only one thing that it's right for me to do, uh, to finally balance the universe, as it were. Dance with your mom, Timmy! Dance with your mom! Alright, Betty, job of flipping dumb. You did it! I knew you could! And a particularly brutal way to deal with it, at that. Very effective. And with that, you win a prize. You may ask a single question of me and receive an honest answer. Though yes, he does kind of uh, lie by omission if you ask after your father, because you 100% do not get a straight answer. Oh my, what a splendid turn of events. I had no idea the two of you were related. Yes, I have indeed seen him. I'm afraid he's rather unavailable at the moment. Okay, now that there is a catastrophically unhelpful answer. You promised me an honest, straightforward answer, and I did not get that. Were I you, I'd be more concerned with myself at the moment. And besides, we're done with questions for now. Perhaps we'll address it at a later time. First, I have something else for you to do. And go on, Betty. What's up next? Pay a visit to the Rockwells. They're very happily married. And I'd like you to change that. Put an end to their marriage. And we'll talk. And there we flipping go. Break up the marriage and no problem whatsoever. Yes, indeed. The Rockwells. You may recall previously I asked you to keep in mind uh, who was stressed versus who wasn't according to the computer equipment. And uh, the Rockwells... Uh, both were, as indeed it was Martha Simpson, and we're about to learn why. Here we go, Martha. How about you tell me about the Rockwell's marriage? Why are you asking me? I don't know anything, and why should I care about their marriage anyway? Oh my goodness, I'd say you're most definitely hiding something, Martha. 
And while we're in Mrs. Simpson's house, we can just nip up to the bedroom and grab ourselves some lacy underwear. Mag flipping nificence. And in the Rockwell house, once again, an incredibly boring speech check just resolves the matter instantly. Don't you worry about that. And uh, yes, indeed, Janet. Anything you'd like to tell me about your marriage? Our marriage? Well, goodness, what kind of a question is that? Mabel didn't put you up to this, did she? What a silly thing to ask about. Roger, however, might accidentally give you a bit more information. Now see here. That's not anything for you to be asking about. Our marriage is our business and it's private. Why can't people just understand that and just leave us alone? So, okay, pretty clear indication people have been prying into their marriage previously. And uh, yes, indeed, Mabel Henderson was mentioned by Janet. Well, they're just so nice, aren't they? It's good the two of them worked everything out. Okay, worked everything out, you say? Oh, I, well, I'm not one to talk, but there was that fight last year. Everyone could hear them arguing. Janet thought there was something going on with Roger and Martha Simpson. He eventually convinced her it wasn't true. But I've seen the way Martha looks at him. Janet may believe him, but I sure don't. So, all right, the local gossip Mabel, once you've been told to speak to her, she can fill you in. This may be a ridiculous fake idyllic simulation, but that doesn't mean there's not some interpersonal drama going on anyway. At this point, you've broadly got two ways of resolving this if you don't just want to do the straight up speech check. So, the lacy underwear we picked up earlier, we can dump that on Roger's desk down in the basement. She's, let's just say, not desperately happy about that. Roger, you son of a bitch. What? What did I do? You just couldn't stay away from her, could you? And what, you didn't think I'd find out? You disgust me! Janet, what are you talking about? You left her underwear on your goddamn desk, Roger. How stupid do you think I am? I have no idea what you're talking about, Janet. Just calm down and let's work this out. The hell with working this out. I'm sick of you. I'm staying at Mabel's tonight. Don't talk to me. Don't even look at me. So there we go, she just wanders off, but I can't help but notice that in that scenario, nobody ended up dead. So, um, how about we try option number three? Just nip upstairs and read Janet Rockwell's diary. I just don't know what to do anymore. When Roger's not in that stupid basement, he's outside sweet-talking that hussy Martha Simpson. He claims there's nothing between them. I know it's all a lie. I found a woman's pendant once on Roger's workbench, but of course, I said nothing. That's me, Janet Rockwell, prim and proper housewife, living a perfect life here on Tranquility Lane. Some days I wish I really had beat to death with that rolling pin, then Roger would know I'm the only girl in the world. Now admittedly, we don't know for certain whether there was ever an affair between Roger and Martha. It's never confirmed with absolute certainty. But given, yes, there seems to be pretty compelling evidence Roger is into Martha, and Martha is into Roger right back, at the bare minimum, there seems to be an emotional affair going on. Right, having read oh, that, we just go and grab the rolling pin that was just mentioned. Lovely, that's now my weapon. And now we just go and commit a murder. She goes down, nice and easy. In fact, wow, her arm fell off. Honestly, I was not expecting that. Now we just take the blood smeared rolling pin straight back to Mr. Rockwell. Oh my god, what is that? Is that blood? And brains? Janet did this to Martha? She really did snap, didn't she? My god, Janet, what have you done? What on earth are you talking about, Roger? How could you? How could you do that to her? Have you lost your mind? Roger, stop it. You're scaring me. You should be in a sanitarium or a prison. You're out of your damn mind. You just stay away from me, you hear me? And there we go. She just runs straight on off. And Janet moves in with the local gossip, Mabel Henderson. Though, yes indeed, the simulation will be reset in a matter of moments, so everybody dead comes back to life, etc, etc. Lovely. And there we go. I once again get to ask a question I already know the answer to, but have apparently forgotten. Okay, bare minimum, I don't know what my father wanted from Braun from information I got 
within Vault 112, uh, though, yes, the tape that actually brought me here did tell me he was looking for the Gex. So, okay, once again, another question I do already know the answer to. Your father, frustrating as he was, recognized the significance of some of my previous work. He came to gather information on it. He was most pleased to be able to ask me directly, but he failed to understand how things work here. He was unwilling to compromise, to do anything I asked of him. And so, our discussions ended. Seriously, despite what she says, Betty will not give you a straight answer to anything. Alright, there's no reason why Braun shouldn't just tell you at this point, it was the Gek. We already know about the Gek. It was mentioned in the Jefferson Memorial. Let's raise the stakes. I'd like you to kill Mabel Henderson. But do put some effort into it. Make it creative. Beating her to death simply won't suffice. Gosh darn it, Betty, it's what I'm best at. Ah, uh, yes, and before we get to that, I'm glad I didn't forget about this. Yes, indeed, you may notice after the first mission, Timmy disappears. He simply is not in the simulation anymore. And uh, there's a reason for that. It's because uh, he's right here. This is now Timmy. Timmy the bloody gnome. You can't actually do anything with Timmy, says activate Timmy the gnome. You cannot activate Timmy the gnome. Timmy the gnome is simply a gnome now, and uh, there are two potential explanations for this. One in-universe and one out of universe. The in-universe reason is that this might be a reference to the original story behind this bit of Fallout 3, which is 1961's Twilight Zone episode, It's a Good Life, itself an adaptation of the 1953 short story by Jerome Bixby, who, fun fact, went on to write four episodes of the original run of Star Trek. If, however, you didn't happen to be around in 1961, there's a very good chance you're more familiar with, yes, the various parodies of this very famous episode of The Twilight Zone. Perhaps the most famous of all is The Simpsons' Treehouse of Horror 2, the story where Bart has incredible psychic powers and thus everyone in town has to do whatever he says, otherwise he'll do terrible things to them. It was a parody of, yes, this 1961 episode of The Twilight Zone. And in that episode, and indeed in the Simpsons parody, that there's a good chance many of you will be more familiar with, someone gets turned into a jack-in-the-box. In both cases, the father of the child with the incredible psychic powers. I mean, we already know from, yes, the terminal we read earlier, that Braun has the ability to change people's forms, and if you know what ultimately happens and where your dad is, yes, indeed, we know he can change people into other things. So, it entirely makes sense in the universe that Braun can turn Timmy into a gnome if it happens to entertain him, though you can't actually challenge him on that point in any way whatsoever. But there's another reason it might have happened too, which is, uh, coming up at the end of this section, I'm going to be asked to kill everybody in tranquility. Lane and uh, well we all know that modern fallout basically concluded uh, you can't kill children because uh, too many ratings agencies in too many nations uh, get really upset with that and refuse your game classification so you can't even sell your game in that nation as a result of that yes you can't kill children and I suspect this might be why Timmy is just politely turned into a gnome after his section is done so that he doesn't end up getting murdered in the murder section. Okay, but now I've said that out loud, now I'm just curious. If you, yes, before you interact with Timmy at all, and thus Timmy hasn't yet been turned into a gnome, activate the Chinese failsafe immediately. Okay, Chinese soldiers pop in, everybody gets absolutely shredded, not me though, I don't seem to exist. Hang on, where's, uh, where's Timmy's house? Timmy the gnome isn't here, so that would suggest... Bloody hell, where's Timmy? Does Timmy just get despawned when the Chinese arrive? Is that what happens? Hang on. Hang on, hang on, hang on. We need to find Timmy. Well, the Chinese commanders have got bored and Timmy's corpse definitely isn't here. So, okay, confirmed. Fallout 3 is so determined for children not to die that if you attempt to spawn the commandos in early, Timmy just disappears out of existence. Sorry, got so distracted trying to kill Timmy there, I forgot I was supposed to be killing Mabel Henderson, though. Unfortunately, yes. This final step before we get to the straight-out murder is not the most interesting. I think it's a lot less interesting, especially than the whole divorce business. There are four solutions. They're all incredibly simple. So, yes, you can sabotage the oven right here. Use the terminal to get her own Mr. Handy to slaughter her. Or alternatively, oh, yes, yeah. tamper with either the chandelier right here. Or go and get a, yes, roller skate from 
Hang on, where is the roller skate? Possibly that comes from a, a different house. I actually can't remember. Hang on, where's the roller skate gone? Oh, never mind. There it is right there at the top of the stairs. So, yes, basically you just press A against a thing of your choosing and she dies. It is relatively unexciting, to be honest. Probably the best of a bad bunch is, yes, fiddling with the pilot light so that she explodes when she goes to the stove. Because, uh, bare minimum, at least in that case, you're actually leading her to her death by tricking her to going to the well, stove by asking for some lovely pies. And there she goes catching fire. Lovely. Honestly, it's not that great of a death, but yes, Mabel Henderson, there's just not that much you could do with her, really. And now, we come to the last tasks that I have for you. Succeed, and you shall be granted whatever you wish. And oh, Betty, I cannot flipping wait. Your enthusiasm is inspiring. It's a shame you didn't arrive earlier. Now, you will become the pint-sized slasher and kill everyone in Tranquility Lane. Behind the abandoned house, there is a doghouse. Inside that doghouse are the knife and the mask you will take up. And here we go, the pint-sized slasher, which is one of the weirdest things in Fallout 3 to my mind. He is a figure of myth, born of old campfire stories. You will make him a reality. The residents will know you and they will fear you. When they have all been eliminated, return to me. And there we flip it go. That's all the information we're getting. And uh, yeah, Fallout 3 spends a lot of time building up this myth of uh, the pint-sized slasher. But it never really gets much in the way of payoff. And uh, when I say build up, bear in mind, of course, this is uh, the grand finale of one of two ways of completing a main plot mission that's the climax of the first act of the entire game. They put the pint sized slasher in a really important mission. And on top of that, something it's really easy to forget, by the way, in the very first trailer for Fallout 3, this is E3 2008. The very first scene that we get to see, the family sitting around the breakfast table, the father is reading a newspaper, and the pint-sized slasher is mentioned explicitly on the prop newspaper that he's reading. They were really proud of this invention. They really wanted to put it front and centre. So just head over to the dog house that was mentioned, and there we go. I am now the pint-sized slasher with my pint-sized slashing mask. But um, yeah, beyond this, you just never really get much payoff as to what was the deal with the pint-sized slasher. Now, obviously, you can get the mask in real life outside of the simulation, I mean, in Point Lookout. But there's no particular reason to believe, yeah, that either of the two masks you can find in Point Lookout are actually the original pint-sized slasher serial killer mask. In both cases, they're almost certainly just Halloween decorations. So just hunt down some people and make sure we use vats because, uh, yes indeed, the downside of this section is that all these people can run faster than you. In part because, uh, yes, according to Bethesda logic, this is true in many of their games, uh, speed is partly a function of height. The shorter the character, the slower they are, the taller they are, the faster they go. So unfortunately, yes, um, I'm actually slower than the various adults around me. It's very difficult to catch up with them, especially when I've got a weapon out. So unless you happen to get lucky and they hold still, like this guy did right here, if they do run, yes, it can be a bit tricky to catch up with them, unfortunately. And yes, after that, the pint-sized slasher just never appeared again. We never got any closure as to what the deal was pre-war with this urban myth of a child serial killer. Aside that is from one further piece of information. That newspaper article that the father was reading in the live action section of the Fallout 3 trailer, that is the same newspaper article that shows up on occasion on loading screens. Now on the loading screen it appears and disappears very fast, the entire article is invisible, you can't really get much information out of that. But there is one location in this game where you can access the full in-universe news article about Pint Size Slasher. So just let me finish stabbing everybody nice and quick, lovely. Make sure to give Timmy a few slashes on the way past. Screw you, Timmy the gnome. That's it. All the murder is completed. Betty will now reveal the terrible truth to me. Before she does, though, make sure you just, uh, yes, give a doc the dog a quick slash in the face. Beautiful. Most enjoyable. 
Most enjoyable indeed. I haven't felt this exhilarated in years. Oh, Betty, I had a great time. I had the distinct impression you enjoyed yourself. We are like you and I. Now, you ask for the means to leave Tranquility Lane, and so I grant it to you. The door is open. You are, of course, welcome to stay a bit longer if you like. And there we flip it go. I can leave, though. Okay, the dog is... Okay, the dog's fine. I'm sure you're supposed to tell me about my dad at this point. I've given you permission to leave. I suggest you take the opportunity before I change my mind. I'm even being so gracious as to allow your father to exit as well. His presence here failed to amuse me some time ago. Okay, possibly me attacking the dog in the face kind of broke her script because I'm sure she's supposed to tell me about this. Still, out we go and I am indeed very curious about one thing in particular I've never bothered to check before. Just to hop out. My dad is hopefully okay. Yep, he seems to be doing just fine. Sorry about all of the murder, by the way. You've saved me. I was afraid I'd be trapped in there forever. Oh, it's so good to see you, but what are you doing here? Okay, he doesn't seem to mind at all about the various murders, including his. Beautiful. I was right about Braun. The technology he developed is unstable, even dangerous but it can be adapted for Project Purity. I need to return to Rivet City and talk with Madison. If we can find a Gek, we can make Project Purity work. So there we go, he got the information he needed, he's back off to Rivet City and he's welcome to do so, we'll catch up with him later. As I say, there's one more thing I want to check. Oh, tragically not. I was kind of hoping that, yes, based on what you did inside the simulation, the stress level of each character would be affected. So, you know, Timmy ought to be a bit stressed out by what you did to him. But then again, we do know that memories get reset along with the simulation, so I guess it does make sense that his stress level would be the same as it ever was. Yep, best as I can tell, everyone's stress level is as precise as it was before. That's a shame, I was actually hoping I might discover something new about Fallout 3 I never knew before. But, what can you do? Anyway, back to what I was saying before. The only place in the game you can get any more information whatsoever about the pint size slasher. Here we go, just around the corner from where we began the episode. The Irradiated Metro. So just nip underground here and follow the one and only path through. There's no branching path in here, just keep going, you'll get to the destination you want. Here we go, barely around the corner and we have got ourselves a brand new region of the DC ruins. There's a fair few things dotted about in this bit of the world and many, many, many super mutants it must be said, but my destination is right in front of me. A building I've actually mentioned to you previously as early as, uh, yes, our trip to Minefield, the Capitol Post Headquarters. The office is actually extremely small. It's basically just two rooms, a handful of rad roaches, nothing dangerous in here at all, but it does contain a couple of rather interesting things. You may recall me mentioning way back in, what was it, episode three or whatnot, here we flipping go, it's Gibson. Containing his key and a scrap of paper, reading simply, search the house. All part of the rather elaborate minefield easter egg we've discussed before. The computers, however, are probably the real stars of the show, which is, if you've ever wanted to see the full newspaper articles that are sort of a bit but not properly visible during the loading screens, that's what's on all of these terminals. And some of the dates might be useful in, yes, just piecing together the exact Fallout chronology. So, for example, yeah, June 3rd, 2072, we now know that the front page stories were US to Annex Canada, so we know that's when that was publicly announced, and development of Super Weapon confirmed, though, yes, the story is slightly vague on precisely what the Super Weapon's going to be. One reasonably assumes, however, it's power armor that would go on to be rolled out in Operation Anchorage, though Liberty Prime is a possibility as well. Wow. But here's the one I want, significantly before the war in fact, July 27th, 2052. So, United Nations disbanded, not important. What's important is, the pint-sized slasher, more than myth. 
So what American child alive hasn't heard the story of the pint-sized slasher, the diminutive demon in a clown mask who stalks and slashes the innocent residents of supposedly safe suburbia? Just one of the many folk stories parents use to scare their youngsters into behaving themselves. Or is it? According to the Germantown police chief Joseph Field, the pint-sized slasher may be more real than many people would like to admit. After reviewing the autopsy results of the Linden Street slayings, we've confirmed the force and direction of every knife wound are consistent with an attack from a much smaller assailant, a child to be precise. Add to the sinister forensic findings this statement from Christopher Atkinson, the one surviving victim of the adolescent assassin, and it becomes clear the pint-sized slasher does indeed walk among us. The clown, the clown, he's going to kill us all. Do you understand me? He stabbed my brother Sean right in the face. He killed my brother, the little clown. But assuming the pint-sized slasher is indeed a real tangible threat to the peace-loving residents of DC suburbia, one question remains. Why? What could possibly motivate a child to don a clown mask and murder innocent people in cold blood? We may never know, at least not until the miniature maniac is brought to justice. Until then, all we can do is lock our doors, kiss our children goodnight, and pray they live to see the morning. And uh, yes indeed, that's the full story of the pint-sized slasher, but we just never got any closure. The costume does show up in Fallout 76, but it doesn't add anything to the story whatsoever. And there is a piece of Creation Club content for Fallout 4, but it's confirmed that's just a copycat who happens to be wearing the Halloween costume and is in no way connected to the original pint-sized slasher. So, yes indeed, for some reason, Bethesda decided to create this urban myth, put it right in the centre of their game, and then never explain what the cop was going on with it. So how about we call it a part there, but next week we do a bit more urban exploring. Specifically going into, yes, not just this region, and the various rather fascinating things hidden away in this bit of the world. But on top of that, how about we take an excursion to the most well-hidden, buried-away corner of the entirety of the DC ruins. Join me next week and I'll explain what I mean. Hopefully you're looking forward to that. But in the meantime, I've been John. This has been many a true nerd. And this has been Fallout, Tale of Two Wastelands. Thank you very much, and goodbye. If we just hide the bodies, nobody needs to know about this. Yes! My stupid, stupid plan has worked! It turns out I'm a genius! The giant rat scorpion is not gone! Oh, hang on, there's, there's more yet, though. I'm still being very shocked. Guys, where's the NCR? Nobody needs to know.